Well, today in person at King Street Community Church, we're baptizing a number of people who have put their saving faith in Jesus. And uh, we would love to be able to show that to you on our YouTube channel, uh, but we're not there yet. But we're in the process of having some uh, really healthy conversations about what it would look like for us to develop a live stream. So uh, stay tuned, and uh, we hope as we head towards the back end of the year that we'll have uh, future updates for you on what that could look like. Um, but it's so different when we gather in person, and uh, we're happy to have you on this YouTube channel. And uh, But if you are local and you're able, we would love to have you come join us, 611 King Street West in Oshawa, and uh, it would be just good to see you in person as well. So uh, just in case you happen to be new to church uh, or you're uh, at the edges of faith and wondering what water baptism is about, um, here's the best way I can describe it to you. Water baptism is like being in a turn lane um, and you're turning left with your turn signal on. You're telling everybody else where you're headed. It's the direction of your life. And those who have been water baptized and who are being water baptized today, they're going public saying, this is the direction of my life. And they're being immersed in water, identifying with the Lord Jesus through his death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, so water baptism is a beautiful picture of identifying with Jesus and sending a signal or a message to others about the direction of your life. And so if by chance you haven't been baptized in water, it's the next right thing to do after we put our saving faith in Jesus. We would love to help you with that next step. And we always do this. We do it three or four times a year. And so you can reach out to us and we'll help you with the next opportunity. So we've been working through this series of scripture talks called The Elephant in the Family Room. And we've talked about grieving what we haven't had. Uh, grief and loss is real in family. Uh, we talked about the uh, two-circle view of family, the uh, family of origin, that we don't have any, um, uh, any power over deciding which family we'll be born into. And then there is this other family, the family of God, uh, whereby we get a choice to step into that circle. And uh, Jesus affirmed both circles, and both of them offer tremendous value in our lives. And then we talked last week about being alone um, and the power and the role of friendships. And today we're going to talk about healing from family pain. Um, I don't think any family, well, I know this, no family ever sets out to self-injure um, or to um, kind of undermine uh, its, its, uh, its health or its well-being. But it happens because life happens. And people respond in all sorts of ways to life, and both in healthy and unhealthy ways. And so, like I said, no one sets out to, um, to undermine their family or to self-injure, so to speak. Uh, but we, we end up hurting one another in our families. And so some of us grew up in families where we had a front row seat to addiction or to uh, abuse or neglect or abandonment or divorce. Words have been spoken, and some of those words kind of continue to be repeated in your in your mind and you, you they've gone into your soul and they've injured your heart. And um, so wounds from family are real. Uh, and because they come from the um, closest people to us, they carry a, a sharp edge. And um, like I said before, family presents so many opportunities for, for growth and development. And it's intended for our safety and protection. And yet when those things don't occur, uh, we can feel really injured, bruised right to the soul. So our passage to ponder that we've been taking with us over the last number of weeks um, is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 7, just two verses. And uh, it's worth actually thinking about the, um, uh, the power of these words. Uh, Peter writes and says, the end of all things is near. Now we've been talking about that. Peter wrote these words almost 2,000 years ago, not quite. And he says, the end of all things is near. And he wrote that then, which means things must be near, nearer to the end now. Uh, just the chronology of time and the way life works. If it was near then, it's nearer now. And he says, because of that, he says, be alert and sober-minded so that you can pray to carry on an ongoing conversation with God, both speaking with him and listening for him. And then he says, above all else, or above all, he says, love each other deeply. In, in, in light of the fact that the end of all things is near, what do we do? We love each other deeply, profoundly. And he says, love covers over a multitude of sins. And I love that about God's kind of love. Um, God is not in the business of running around exposing us. 
or pointing out all of our weaknesses and judging us severely. God is not in that business. God will sometimes uncover something for us if it's in our best interest. Uh, but love covers. You know, there's this beautiful idea that when Jesus died on the cross, um, the atonement, which means literally two, a party, two parties who are, who are apart are brought near. They're now at one, at one mint, atonement. And, and God is in the business of bringing people together. In fact, relationships, if they're going to thrive, it's going to require that we choose to cover one another's weaknesses, frailties, and failures. Because if we keep score and if we run around pointing out all the things that other people have done, it won't take long before we'll accumulate in our heart a score sheet that says you owe me or you have a debt that needs to be repaid to me. And you can't relate to somebody as an equal if they owe you. They can't be a debtor to you. And this is why God cancels our debt in Christ and so that we can relate to him. Jesus says he calls his disciple, uh, his disciple friends, friends. Um, they're no longer just servants, they're his friends. And friends uh, relate on an equal plane. And so um, this idea of love covering a multitude of sins is huge. Now, and what we're about to talk about when it comes to the wounds that we experience from, from family or this idea of healing from family pain, um, this last part of the verse is going to be huge for us. We're going to need to learn to forgive. And that's canceling debts. Um, so we're going to take a look at um, a character in the Bible and his uh, immediate family. And then we're going to dive into three, uh, what I would call application points for you. And I will be a little briefer today. Um, but the Bible character, his name is Jacob. And um, again, if you're new to the Bible, just a 30,000 foot view. It's been written over about 1,500 years. And 40 authors contributed to it. And it is one unified story that leads us to Jesus. Um, it contains stories of people, uh, people's lives that are intended to help us learn from what they got right and what they didn't get so right. And the Bible is not a record of perfect people. And all of us who are watching by YouTube can say, yes, then there's room for me because none of us are perfect either. Um, it's a story. The Bible is a story about God and his desire to relate to um, the friends he made in the garden and then all the friends he continues to make because God continues to create by making more and more people, expanding his love because he wants to share his love with others. And it's about God's desire to relate with people. And, uh, and, and again, the Bible is a record of how people follow his ways and what that leads to and how people have rejected his ways and what that leads to. So this morning again, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're known as the patriarchs of Israel. If, if again, you read the Older Testament, it won't take you long before you discover this important uh, triad, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their families. God made a promise to Abraham, and then this promise is spread out throughout biblical history, uh, culminating in Jesus and how he is the one who is the blessing to the whole world by offering us forgiveness and canceling our debts. Um, but most importantly, they're not perfect people and they didn't get it right. In fact, if you trace through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you'll see that there was uh, some themes that emerged and one of them was lying, that they struggled with telling the truth. And I won't parse that out for you today, but that was something that was a generational sin or a generational um, weakness in that family. So today we're gonna to talk about marital wounds, sibling conflict, and parental, parental hurt. Um, we're going to talk about marital wounds, sibling conflict, and parental hurt. And um, all from the life of Jacob. Uh, with his wife, Leah. Uh, Jacob with his brother, Esau. And then Jacob, who had uh, 12 sons, but how he treated the last two that were born to him, Joseph and Benjamin, a little bit different than the previous 10. And, um, and so, marital wounds, sibling conflict, and parental wounds. So we'll start with uh, the pain of, of um, uh, marital wounds between Jacob and Leah. So uh, those of us who are married know this, that marriage is a wonderful opportunity uh, for nurture and connection. Uh, and it can be also a place of tremendous pain and disappointment. Um, the nature of the marriage relationship is one of vulnerability, disclosure, attachment, and connection. Um, and when the relationship is violated, and it happens, um, in some way, uh, or is not nurtured or neglected, the wound is real and it's lasting. And, and this was the case for Leah. 
Um, she longed for her husband's love and affection, but it was withheld. And if you're new to the Bible, there's some complications to this story because, uh, and, and there's, um, there's uh, not time for us to unpack it today, but there was a second spouse. Jacob was married to Rachel and Leah, and both Rachel and Leah were sisters. That's a larger backstory. But I will tell you this, in the New Testament, it's not prescribed for us to have more than one wife. Um, whew, that's clear, that's helpful. Um, and uh, just because it's recorded doesn't mean it's recommended. Um, that would require more time than we have today. Uh, but the pain for Leah was that she craved love, um, like we all do. And, and she was so close to it. Uh, but it, it always seemed to be out of reach for her. It was like she always went window shopping, but when she pulled on the door to go into the store, it was always locked. Or it was like for her that when she would pull up a chair to a restaurant table and look at the menu, there was never a server that would come by and take her order. Or it was like she went to a dance, but nobody ever asked her to dance. And so she was so close to love, but she couldn't grasp it. Let me just read this passage to you. It's actually quite painful to read. This is a real person who lived out a real story and the Bible records it for us. Genesis 25, beginning of verse 32. So Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now, she says. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved. Do you hear the pain? God has seen her. God has heard her. And both times she feels unloved. Um, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time, she says, I will praise the Lord. It's almost like she'd lost hope. And she said, I'm, I'm not going to hope and hold on to my husband's affection. I am actually going to praise the Lord. I'm going to shift my attention to God. So she named him Judah, and then she stopped having children. And so she had a series of children for Jacob, and yet she was unloved. So we need to pause there for just a second. And in our larger culture, we need to kind of name this. Um, one big point from this story is this. Sex is not love. Uh, you can have sex and not love somebody. Uh, they're not the same thing. However... Uh, when we are in a monogamous, heterosexual, marital covenant, uh, sexual expression with the person that God gave us is a beautiful expression of love. Um, however, you can have sex and not necessarily love the person you're with. This was the experience of Leah. She felt unloved. So Leah felt unloved, and we know entirely why. Uh, we don't know entirely why, in fact. It, it could have been because of emotional disengagement. Um, the way that Jacob prioritized his time. Um, it could have been that he loved his work more than he loved his, his wife. But the text tells us here that his affection was towards Rachel and not toward Leah. And again, it's a cultural context, a backstory that needs to be unpacked in some way, but we don't have time for it today. This was an allowance in the Older Testament. What we do know is this. Leah felt unloved because she compared herself and what Jacob loved. And she was on the other side of what he prioritized. And so um, we can be in marriages and we can feel the pain. We can feel the wound on the heart when we are comparing ourselves to what our spouse loves perhaps more than us. And it can be work and it can be uh, all sorts of pursuits that leave the spouse craving love and feeling unloved. That's very real. All right, secondly, the pain of sibling conflict. We're going to come back to an application point about the marital wound in just a, a few moments, but we're going to keep moving through the, the marriage, um, the sibling side, and then the parental, the parental pain as well. So the pain of sibling conflict. This is Jacob and Esau. I'm introducing biblical characters to you today. Hopefully I'm not moving too quickly. But Jacob and Esau are brothers. Um, again, we can pick our spouse, but we can't pick our siblings. Um, and apart from Cain and Abel, uh, there are probably no other famous siblings in the Bible. 
uh, than, than Jacob and Esau. Cain and Abel had finished tragically with Cain killing his brother. In this situation, that wasn't the case, even though there's lots of tragedy here too. Um, sibling rivalry, rivalry, uh, the competition for the affection and approval of the parent uh, or parents is so real. Um, there are some who are watching who never had another sibling. You're an only child. And uh, that brought its own challenges, of course. Uh, but those of you who do have a sibling understand the power of sibling rivalry. Uh, Genesis 25 tells the story of Jacob and Esau. And, and God permits the writer to give us a bit of insight into even what was happening in the womb from the very beginning. So after this, the biblical writer says, um, and the Bible describes the two boys tussling or wrestling in the womb. Um, so he says, after this, his brother came out. Um, and, and this is Jacob who comes out. Uh, Jacob came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, which means he grasps the heel or supplanter or deceiver. Um, Isaac, which is Jacob's father, was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Again, gave birth to both Jacob and Esau. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. Let's pay attention to this for a second. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. But Rebecca loved Jacob. We'll pause there for just a sec. We've got mom and dad playing favorites already. One loves one son more than the other, and the other vice versa. We've got Isaac and Rebecca already beginning to demonstrate that um, sibling favoritism is okay. Um, we'll carry on here. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished, the text says. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. I'm not sure if that was dramatic or not. I think it probably was. He says, look, I'm about to die. Have you ever said, I am starving when you're hungry? Oh, we're really not starving. We're just really, really hungry. I have a feeling that this is the case for, uh, for Esau. He says, I am, I'm about to die, Esau said. Well, what good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore on oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau, it says, despised his birthright. Esau comes in from the far country. He's exhausted from hunting. He wants something to eat. He sells his birthright to his brother. Well, what does that mean to us in the 21st century? Here's what it means. Uh, Esau was the firstborn, the text tells us. And back in, in, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, we learn that the, um, the birthright is given to the first son, which means they get a double portion of the estate. They get twice the inheritance. So it's worth something very significant uh, in biblical times. And he sells that to his younger brother. Now, we can pause for a second and say, I don't know what was wrong uh, with Jacob. Why, why couldn't he just offer his brother some stew? You know, he comes in, he's starving, he wants to eat something, and he says, no, sell me your birthright. It's a little indication of some of the sibling rivalry that had been going on that maybe, perhaps, mom and dad had been um, contributing factors as they had their own favorite. Um, it, it can be very much that way, that in families, that parents make choices, and maybe it's subtle or maybe it's overt. And it actually stokes the fire of unhealthy sibling favoritism. So um, Jacob's name means, as I mentioned, supplanter or deceiver or the one who grasps the heel and for good reason, because that's what took place. But that name does not define Jacob, which I love about this story. Um, Jacob has this encounter with uh, kind of a cryptic figure, but the way it's described in the Bible, it's pretty clear near the end that who he's wrestling with is, is God. And he has this, uh, this wrestling moment. I'm not sure all the particulars of what happened, but in that moment, Jacob has his name changed. He's no longer gonna be defined as the person who grasps the heel or who deceives or who supplants or who perhaps manipulates and takes advantage of someone else. He's gonna be known as somebody. His name literally means Israel now the one who wrestles with God. 
So he's no longer just going to be wrestling in the womb with man, so to speak, and then come out the other side, not the best version of himself. Instead, he's going to be someone who wrestles with God. The text says, then the man, this God figure, said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and you have overcome. It's a really, really powerful passage. And so we do not need to be defined by our worst moments or by the past failures or regrets of yesterday or yesteryear. God holds out for us a new identity when we choose to kind of go hand to hand with God. And, uh, and he invites all of us to do so. But this is a little picture of some of the challenges in families. And again, just like in the marital conversation, we're gonna to get to an application point that helps even with some of the sibling conflict we can experience. Want this talk to be incredibly helpful and we'll get there as we get to the end. Number three, the pain of parental hurt. Jacob plays favorites. He learned it somewhere from his father, Isaac, and his mother, Rebecca. Um, the greatest gift that a parent can ever give a child is unconditional love. It's not money, it's not opportunities, it's security, it's generosity, the generosity of unfailing, reliable love. We crave it, we crave acceptance, we crave unconditional love, and we crave it so badly that if we don't get it in our family of origin, we will go somewhere else to try to get anything that resembles it. We were made to love and be loved, and if, it's, if we're deprived of it in some way, we will go on a search, and it can lead us to all sorts of dark places to get that feeling of love and acceptance. Now, if you're watching today and you've had children who've gone off to the far country, so to speak, and who've turned their back on you, rejected you, maybe rejected the ways of God as well, and uh, I don't want you to feel like, I guess it was, we didn't love well. You can love your kids well. You can give them safety, security, acceptance, all the things I talked about. Everyone has a, a choice to make, freedom to express, and, and values to adopt, and all of those things. But generally speaking, we set our kids up for success when we can provide a safe, secure environment for them where they know with, beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're loved and accepted as they are. And, uh, and no parent gets it right all the time. I've raised two young adult daughters and I hope I've got it right more than I got it wrong. But all of us can be honest here that we could go back and say, I would say that differently. I would act a little differently here and there. I'd work on myself a little better in this area so that I didn't, I didn't uh, cause that to be an overflow into my family. We all have those moments. Thanks be to God for his grace. But I would say this to you, and I've said it in previous talks, it is so valuable to own your stuff before your kids. Acknowledge your shortcomings. Say sorry. Say I was offside. That goes miles because they know you're offside anyway. And if they think you're blind to it or you're stubborn and you won't say sorry, you're actually messaging that to them the way they ought to conduct themselves in the world too. And that will not bring the best version of themselves to the table in life either. So if we feel unloved like Leah or underloved compared to other siblings, uh, we can feel the sting uh, of that denied craving. And, and often we can act out. And you've probably heard this said before. If I can't be good at being good, then I'll be good at being bad. <laughs> Have you heard that before? Where one sibling just can't measure up to the other. Uh, this one always gets it right, whether it's at school or in sports or in the arts or whatever it is. And, and this one tries, but just can't keep up. They have different gifts, different capacities. Uh, if, I, if I can't be good at being good, then I'll be good at being bad. And it's a desire for attention and, and to be recognized. And, and as parents, we just need to have the wisdom of God to be able to see that and to act and respond accordingly. So um, again, uh, Jacob had his favorites. Remember, Leah and Rachel. Leah gave birth to a host of kids. Rachel gave birth to two. There's 12 tribes of Israel, 12 kids, descendants, or 12 boys born to, to Jacob and, and his wives. He played favorites. The last two were Joseph and Benjamin because they were born to his beloved Rachel. Um, and the text says in Genesis 37, now Israel, which is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because she, he was born to Rachel. Because he had, born, had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. This is the robe of many colors, right? And, and then finally, playing the story forward, Joseph has had an adventure that you could only imagine. And uh, he ends up as, as, as Pharaoh's right arm in Egypt. 
and there's a famine in the land and Jacob and his sons are, are really struggling like the rest of the, the people of Israel uh, under a famine. So the text tells us that he didn't want to send his youngest son because he didn't want to lose him too. So the text says in Genesis 42, then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, remember a son of Rachel, and who happened to be Joseph's brother with the others, with his other sons, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. He was all right with sending the other ones, but I don't want to send Benjamin. You imagine the message that sends to the other boys? It's kind of like, well, I guess we're disposable, but my brother Benjamin here, he's the apple of our dad's eye, and we're just, I don't know what we are. We're leftovers. You imagine what kind of pain that that produces? So here are the principles to live by, and I won't be long. I'm just going to take five minutes or so, flush these out. They could be a talk on their own. But um, let me just share these with you, and I hope they'll be relevant, whether it be in a marriage context, a sibling context, or as a child dealing with some of the pain um, as, as it relates to the, the parenting dynamic and the parenting relationship. Here's the first one. Expect to be hurt. Yeah, I said that, expect to be hurt. We will experience pain in this world and often from the ones closest to us. So expe expectations matter a great deal and here's why. If we never expect to be hurt, when we are hurt, we will be devastated. Remember this, that humans are frail and they often fail. It's true of us and it's true of the others that we call family. All right, secondly, the past still has power in the present when it is unaddressed. The past still has power in the present when it is unaddressed. It's a myth to believe that time heals all wounds. Time can be incredibly helpful, but time alone is just simply time. There might be some residual help there, uh, but it's, it's not true that time heals all wounds. I recently had some back issues. It's been about two plus months for me. Uh, I have been doing some things. I've been uh, putting some special creams and stuff on my back, that muscle relaxants, been going to physio, been doing some exercises. Time plus certain activities bring healing. And so um, it's important that we act uh, over time in ways that will actually help us heal. And what we name, we can reclaim. We have to name it and then we can, uh, we can deal with it. And that's a big part of addressing the past wounds so they don't have power over us in the present. And finally, here it is. Forgiveness gives us a chance to walk free from what once disappointed and deeply wounded us. Forgiving and forgetting are not the same thing. Forgiving is choosing to cancel someone's debt. We've said that many times. It's a financial term. Your visa statement arrives in the mail. Visa canceled your debt. You owe nothing. That's what we need to get toward. And that does, that does very often require time, depending on the depth of the wound. So we want to say, I need to move toward forgiveness. God, help me with that in order for us to heal from family pain and family wounds. I want to pray for you. Then I'm going to invite the host pastors to come back. Lord, thank you again today that you put us in families. Um, and Lord, they are imperfect and flawed. And we have retained some wounds and some pain and, and some severe disappointment and damage along the way. And some are slight and some are quite severe. Uh, pray, Lord, that you would help all of us learn what it means to uh, receive forgiveness from you first and foremost, and then to offer forgiveness to others. And maybe for some of us, we need to actually forgive ourselves for the wounds we've caused to our families. I pray that you would lead us and guide us and heal us most importantly. And uh, Father, we thank you again today that none of us who are watching today are beyond the reach of the God who can heal. Help us to step into your circle of healing so that we can truly be the best version of ourselves. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name.